Okay, we're going to do another article on Neanderthals. Um, I warn you at the start of this, though, that this is an article done by Clyde Winters, and he's trying to talk about genetics and make connections, but a lot of what he says appears to be true. It probably takes somebody like Egyptologist 7 to be able to pick apart and show that he's probably trying to say certain things in certain ways and taking stuff out of context or just using certain statements again. Here we see a Neanderthal depiction that's more modern. Later we'll see one that was before of the same situation and you can tell how the thoughts have changed on the way these people might have looked or been due to genetics and things and facial reconstructions working much better. They always show the face very smoothed off like this and I wonder if he would have more character to his face. Well, they've given him a little scar in his left cheek there, and he's got a little wart or blemish type thing on his cheek there a little bit, one on his nose, so yeah, okay. Uh, he's got light eyes, blondish hair. A lot of depictions nowadays have reddish hair and things too, and they know that they had hair like that. But it only comprises about one to four percent of a common Eurasian person and actually there's more integration into the Orientals than is left even in the Europeans. But people make a big deal out of this because knowing nowadays what make up the modern humans that heralded civilization and how they have a connection to it, other people will definitely like to make connections to this also. And so while many people for years said there was no connection whatsoever. It's been found out through genetics and sequencing and all the things they do with some amazing Caucasian scientists that there is integration in there and where it pretty much came from. And we're going to get into that as we discuss this. So again, this was done by Clyde Winters. And so you have to take everything with a grain of salt for he also says that black people did everything and heralded everything and that's not necessarily true we'll get into that a little later the widespread appearance of Neanderthal DNA Africans have it too and I'm guessing by Africans he means sub-saharan or negroid type people rather than referring to the Caucasian endemic North Africans and Egyptians and things like that but let's just continue. It has long been argued that Neanderthal-derived DNA is found in all non-Africans. As a result, it has been assumed that Africans fail to carry Neanderthal ancestry, even though Neanderthal skeletons have been found in North Africa at Jebel Irhud and Hafa Fatah. He spells Jebel Irhud wrong. Well, it's not actually wrong. It's different. Later, he's going to spell it the other way, and it makes you wonder why he does this, but maybe a clip and paste from different articles. The percentage of Neanderthal ancestry in Africans. The idea that Africans carry fail to carry Neanderthal DNA has recently been proven as wrong. Mark Haber, a British geneticist from the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Hingston, has found that the Tobu in Chad and the Amhara in Ethiopia carry Neanderthal genes, whereas Eurasians carry 2%. Neanderthal ancestry, Ethiopians carry one Neanderthal ancestry, and Central Africans carried 0.5% Neanderthal ancestry. This actually goes from one to four on an average, and I think people have even pegged as high as six, but you don't see it very much, but you see that number that is higher in Eurasians. There's also Denisovan DNA that comes into play here, but that's not what's on the table today. Haber maintains that Africans who carry Neanderthal DNA show gene flow from Eurasians let that sink in the detectable Neanderthal DNA in Africans is found among the Africans that carry the R1B haplogroup. R1B is a Caucasian haplogroup as well as E, because it comes from CMT, or CT as I understand it, and that would have been a Eurasian type haplogroup too. 
Here's another depiction of Neanderthals. Uh, this is a male and female Homo neanderthalensis in the Neanderthal Museum. So they're showing it here. It's kind of a blurry picture, but here you see a man telling you, oh, I don't know, let's just make up something real quick. You can see she's guarding a spear there pretty hard. So she's got tattoos on too, by the way, or at least painting, body painting. Might be tattoos. She has blonder hair and a stern face, and she's, oh, with a spear and things. And he seems to be rather pleased and talking about it. Well, he's probably telling him, you know, you've got to take care of the place and chase away bears for, or anything that comes into this area and whenever we're out hunting. And so you, too, have to be strong like an Amazon. And she's like, oh, they won't get near the kids while you're gone. I can guarantee it. And he goes, listen, you front up and raw at them and everything, but you do not try to charge because then they have an instinct. Sometimes they'll go right after you. So you just make a fetching at her, do whatever, grab a fl branch that's dried that we have over here, stick it in the fire, catch it on fire, and go after him. They'll run from that. Things like that, but don't taunt him into it. Scare him away. Could be what's said there. Who knows? He could be saying that he just farted. Haber believes that R1B haplogroup penetrated Central Africa via two migrations. The first migration, he believes, took place around 6,000 years ago. So this is well after Neanderthals. So any discussion of Neanderthals having done this is out the door, by the way. But in the second migration, around 3,000 years ago. So just 1,000 B.C. And that's definitely off the table, too. But let's continue. The major problem with this theory is that there's no archaeological evidence of a back migration from Eurasia to Africa, he says. But that's strange because even the Egyptians themselves have the integration going back into them that was the pre-proto-dynastic Bedarians and everything else that comes into there. And their ecology shows early European hunter-gatherers. Uh, what you used to call Cro-Magnon. Now, Cro-Magnon has Neanderthal in him, and the Egyptians show they have a higher rate than this 2% he's talking about here, too, inside the ones that they've been able to test. But there is an integration right at that point, but also they know that E and how it reintegrated, and there are so many papers about it, it's not funny, about how this out of Africa people had come back in and how out of Africa theories all just ruined. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But there is definitely archaeological and genetic evidence that it all happened. The discovery of Eurasian admixture among Africans is not a recent discovery, though. Pickerel estimated Eurasian ancestry among Africans from East and South Africa range from 2.2 all the way up in East to 50%. And that the Mande people carry, and he tried to make that a different way, but I said it the correct way. And the Mande people carry 2% Eurasian admixture. So it's just a small amount, like the amount of Neanderthal that some other peoples have. But it's something in there that kicked them in. This supports the original claim of the authors that the Moda article, i.e. the claim as much as 6 to 7% of their ancestry of West and Central Africa groups was Eurasian, was not an error, where it was tried to say that it was over and over again and people have denied it like crazy. They retested it enough times to make a villigo puke. There are numerous populations in East, South, and West Africa that carry Eurasian admixture too. The highest frequency of R1 is found in Western Eurasia. Whoops. R1 variant is also found in King Tud, and that's Caucasian. Oh, whoop. Cruciani et al. claim that the pristine form of R1 M173 was found in Africa, the frequency of which is going to piss me off. Really? The frequency of Y chromosomes of R 
one M173 in Africa ranges between 7 and 95 percent. And Kyoa et al. said that R1M173 averages 39.5 percent in Africa. Uh, now, when he says in Africa, he's not talking about in black people necessarily. He's saying in Africa. So, North African Caucasians that are, of course, endemic, like the Amazi and people like that that are still there to this day that also have blonde hair, blue eyes, and things like that. And it's funny how that area over there near Morocco is going to come into play in just a few minutes. But also these variants he's talking about, some of these are known to be exclusive. So in other words, they have variants that other people don't have. And that's another way that they can prove that one doesn't come from the other and so on. There was an integration back that created them. What? We'll get into it in just a minute. Our haplogroups are characterized by R1, M207, and M173 genetic background. The Eurasian R haplogroups in Africa include M269, RV88, RL754, R1B1A, by the way, and RL. RL278, which is R1B1, and those are all Caucasian also. And so when we talk about Neanderthal having intergression, we aren't talking about that Neanderthals having intergression. We're talking about these Caucasians back migration and that they had Neanderthal admixture, and because of that, it still shows up today. It's one way of proving it. So we look at a graph like this, we can see brown over here in this stripe, uh, right there, next to the yellows, is Paleo-African. And you can see the other people on the planet don't have that same admixture. Like in blue, Western European. They have some red. What's that? That's South Asian showing you that they have some connectives to there and the Asian people but that's for another video Y chromosome V88 R1B1A has its highest frequency among Kadic speakers while the carriers are V88 among Nigro Congress speakers predominantly Bantu people range between 2 to 66 uh, percent said by Cruciana and others 2010 and 2009. Haplogroup V88 includes the mutations M18, V35, and V7. Christiani and others revealed that RV88 also carried by Eurasians, including the distinctive mutations 1835 and V7. In other words, it didn't come from them. That went exactly the other way. And the fact that they have all of these that aren't the same shows you that one did not come from the other and in fact it was an integration of people who had Neanderthal DNA that caused this effect. Haplogroup R1B is found in Africa at various frequencies. Bernal Lee et al. 2009 found that their study of 5.2 percent carried R1B which is a variant RL278 the frequency of R1B1 among the Bantu ranged from 2 to 20 percent, so there's a lot of admix in some of those people. The bearers of RB1, R1B1 among the pygmy populations range from 1 to 25 percent, and they're saying reintegration with those pygmies may have actually caused things too. For the Bantu, late Bantu expansion, they ran through the pygmies. They give some of the variations on a theme that you get from them. The frequency of RL278 among the Guinea-Bissau populations was 12%. The Tabao, Lal, and Sara have frequencies between 20 and 34% of RL754 or R1B1A. So, they've been whited. Bantu farmers. So now we're going to talk about Neanderthal tools. They use Mosterian tools, what they call there. 
These tools were being used in Africa as early as 130,000 years ago. This is places Neanderthals in North Africa. Well, it somehow does, but also it shows you that other people that they have not associated with that as Homo sapiens had similar tools and Altarian forms and things like that that come out of this. And they know it's direct derivatives. So not necessarily so by themselves, but let's continue. The Neanderthal tools found at Jebel Irud and Hal Fatah resemble contemporaneous European Neanderthal tools. The presence of Mysterian tools suggests that Neanderthals mixed with Africans because we know that anatomically modern humans were living in the area at the time. Well, we know that Caucasoids were living in that time. And, in fact, that Jibalurud cave has showed Homo sapiens at 315,000 years ago. So way predating even the thoughts they're talking about of the integration that happened to these people. And it's widely accepted that that integration wasn't necessarily from Neanderthals themselves, but from the Caucasoid people who had bred with those. We know them today as ne uh, Cro-Magnon Man, but if you look up Cro-Magnon Man, it's called Hurley Hunter Gathers of European descent. And why do they change the name? Well, it's because their haplogroup is still extant today. There are people that still have that same thing. So this big evolution that happened didn't happen there. For the startling realization comes whenever you find out the earliest Negroid phenotype skull they've ever found is a mere 4400 BC. And everything that's found before that, and extremely close to before that, so right before that point, the ones they're finding are proto-Negroid, saying that they aren't quite there yet. They're kind of, what? And so this might have been the second integration that he's talking about that took him to a second Larry level. No one knows at this point, be able to pick it apart. But they also have a ghost hominin that shows all of these alleles that they have that are totally different, showing you that that came from somebody who wasn't related directly and that one couldn't have come from the other because it doesn't exist anywhere but there. And there are so many more of variations that only come from Caucasians. The earliest proto-Negroid that they have found is 9100 B.C. And so if we look at modern humans, not anatomically modern humans, for that just means that you've got the two feet, two eyes, two, yeah, that's anatomically modern is not the same thing in archaeology, by the way. But a modern human, the earliest modern human known to the planet was Neanderthal, which goes back, oh, 35,000 years, 38,040 a little more maybe close as 50 so definitely if it went from one way to another it would have had to have gone the other way but there were separate origins actually from a way way back from a common ancestor that predates this very much so a lot of people think that the integration that was there was from an archaic leftover of Homo erectus. The reason they call it a ghost hominin is that they can't get the DNA out of a Homo erectus yet to see whether or not that lines up exactly with it or not. It could be somebody totally different because we just recently found Denisovans and how it works out. And that's just another slight variation on a theme that again wasn't an African species. And there's a lot of people that believe that Homo erectus, due to its archaic form and variations on a theme that it has, had differences in it and in integrations that may not be evident at this point, but it looks like it's there, and these would have rapidly changed into different forms that later evolved into other forms and integrations happened into other forms and so that would definitely make the out of Africa theory null and void especially the fact that if 
you think on a Darwinian theme, he just saw African primitives, and he goes, look, they're all primitives and Khoisan and stuff, and so it must have kind of come out of them, and they never changed, and everybody else turned into spacemen, and it's like, well, no, what if they're so primitive because they're so recent and predate no one, unless you're going to call them a Homo erectus. The North African Neanderthal people used the common Lavoiso Masterian toolkit originally discovered in Europe. Kizerbo said the Neanderthal skeletons came from Jebel Erud, and he spells it different there, and El Guitar in Morocco. And these are where, sure, they show Neanderthals going up there in these dating we're looking at, but they found Homo sapiens, a modern human, oh, pasatomically. Past but they want to have some slight, oh, there's this one part that, that on the skull that may be, and it's a little thick, so maybe still not quite. So the quite now is a fight between people that are arguing it. Well, it's for sure at 165, and the other guys are going, well, it's for sure at 135, and I'll give you 135. Let's go for 160. What makes this so different? Well... The, the couple of skeletons we found have these traits on a few of them, not all of them, that aren't, if that's the right percentage, that's not as evident today as it would be. It's in a lesser percentage, so we're going to call them non-modern humans. Go, really, you're going to go with that? Because if we just had one or two of the others that didn't, you wouldn't even have that argument. That's strange. Kai Zerbo and the Neanderthal skeletons came from Jibril Rud and El Morocco, El Guitar in Morocco. Later, Neanderthal people used the Atarian toolkit, and it was probably Morocco that Neanderthal and Khoisan interacted. No, I, I'm saying that uh, Neanderthal and Khoisan never interacted, but Khoisan interacted with some more of those Gromags, and those Gromags had Neanderthal genetics. That's the way we're going to look at it. That's the way it had to come down whenever you say, well, if these people formed within the last 10,000 years and Neanderthal's been gone, how does that happen? Here's Masturian tools. It's really just three different views in the same one. It's a cutting blade that's been sharpened off, not quite turned into an arrowhead or anything at this point. Carlton S. Kuhn, I love that name, in the Living Races of Man, 1965, Arthropology A to Z, 1963, and the Races of Europe in 1939, claimed that the Khoisan had formerly lived in North Africa from the Atlas Mountains, no, not quite to that point, but in the Sahara North, that they weren't living f shoved down south now. They're shoved down south by the Bantu expansion, which basically just goes right after them and drives them down into the south, which they weren't really a part of at that time. So he claimed that they pushed them down, or that they lived in the Fasan and Zahel, right, area of the desert there. Conan also said, or Kuhn also said that the Dawood also look like Hottentots. Other partially Bushman and partially Negroid people are also to be found in the Sahara. Kuhn maintains that the Horatian also include ancient South African Khoisan, or Sac population elements. So this basically says... Well, the Negroid Negroid that we know of today wasn't involved in any of these other people. And I don't know if you're well aware, but the Khoi San or the Khoi and the San kind of now they're all together. And those people have archaic intergression and admix also. And he's kind of alluding to it there. But they aren't related to Negroids. And they say, well, these Hottentot people look like a mix of the 